welcome to Grace Life Church Podcast. If you would like any more information about us, please visit our website, gracelife.com.au. So this morning, I feel uh, uh, I had something really stir in me in our, our, not the last encounter tonight, but the encounter tonight to a uh, fortnight before. Uh, that yeah, as we come to worship and prayer, I'm seeing more and more that there are different words that I feel God is giving me to preach from those places of, of, of prayer and from those places of rest. And you know, God anoints in those moments when we are not striving, when we're not trying to pressurize. And, and you find that when you, you come to that place of rest, like that, that psalm says, where you just stop, he just downloads all of this stuff. And so I feel that today uh, I want to bring something from a place of revelation. And it is about um, the power of the name of Jesus. I want to preach about the name of Jesus. Now everyone in this room has a name. If you don't have a name, I can give you one. But I'm going to guess that your parents did that already. And I'm going to guess that they probably... Uh, put a bit of thought and effort into your name. And if you watch the trends right now, the, the thought and the effort is kind of changing a little bit because you might be named Apple. Anyone named Apple in the place today? You're blessed if you are. But um, and names are important, right? Names tell us about something. And I just want to ask a couple of names. And so if you know my sense of humor, please don't shout out the answer. Just let everyone else kind of get it. I mean, if you've got a good sense of humor, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, but I'm going to ask a couple of questions about names, and I want to see if you can see what they are. Pete, do not answer. <laughs> Pete knows. All right, ready? What do you call a lady who always sets fire to her power bill and her phone bill? Bernadette. <laughs> Come on. That was like a weird sympathy kind of like, ah, oh, ah. Oh. What do you call a man who is shaking in a pile of leaves? Russell, yeah, come on. What do you call a man who has a, sh- a shovel for a head? Doug. Doug. What do you call a man who doesn't have a shovel for a head? Douglas. You guys are good at this. Has someone done this already? It's just the Holy Spirit, isn't it? What do you call a man who is always at your front door? Matt. Is that Brett Gafty that is answering all these? Joe. No. <laughs> What do you call a man who's always stealing your stuff? Rob. What do you call a man with no shins? This is gold. Tony. There's no shin. All right, this is the last one because I feel like you're getting a little bit over it. What do you call a woman who likes to stand outside when the winds are blowing? Gail. Come on. There you go. There's some good names for you. Yeah, <laughs> I have way more than that, but I will, for your sake, I will just st- stop there. Uh, I, I want to speak this morning about a name that is above every other name, a name that has power, a name that has sovereignty, a name that has authority, and a name that perhaps we take for granted. I want to remind us and encourage us today of the power and the authority that is in the name of Jesus. The name of Jesus. We're going to start off, we're going to bounce around a little bit this morning, but we're going to start off in Luke chapter 10, in verse 17. And to give you some context of what is taking place here, this is where Jesus has called the disciples to himself, and now he is sending them out in groups. He's sending them out, and he's told them that he's going to give them authority. And the authority is to cast out the demonic realms. The the authority is to heal the sick, to lay their hands on the sick and heal the sick. The authority is to do these works that he is calling them to do. And so they go out into the, into the world. They go, they listen, they obey, and then they walk in this authority. And now we're getting to a point where they have come back to Jesus. In verse 17, we're going to read from it. It says, When the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully, they joyfully rep- re- reported to him, Lord, even the demons obey us when we use your name. So Jesus sends them out and he says, this is going to take place. You're going to use the name of Jesus. This is the authority that you're going to go in. Remember at this point that they haven't received the Holy Spirit. 
That's something that, that, that you've got to think about. So they're moving purely in the authority of the name of Jesus. And so he says, this is what's going to happen. You're going to go out, and then you're going to pray for people, and you're going to cast out demons. And look what happens. They return filled with joy. They joyfully return to him, and they're like, Lord, you, even the, the, the demons obey us when we use your name. I picture this like my kids when they come home, and they want to tell us something exciting. And they can't wait to tell what has just taken place. And they'll kind of push each other out of the way to be the first one to tell us what just took place. You see the disciples are like running back to Jesus saying, Lord, you are not going to believe what took place. You're not going to believe what has happened. Even the demonic obeyed and submitted when we used your name. They were, they were, they were blown away. It's almost like, Jesus, you're not going to believe this. And look at what he says. Yes. <laughs> yes, he told them. I saw Satan fall, like, fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over every power of the enemy, and you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you, but don't rejoice because evil spirits obey you. Rejoice because your names are registered in heaven. Let's hold that there because we'll go back to that bit in a little bit. But I want to take the first part there where they come back and they see the power and the authority of Jesus being outworked and they're blown away. And Jesus is like, yep, I told you that was going to happen. I gave you a little bit of a clue that I said that when you go, that's going to take place. And they saw it happen. How many times has that happened to us? Where Jesus says, this is going to happen. You're going to go in this direction. You're going to see these things take place. And then you're like, whoa, it actually happened just as he said it was going to happen. You know, you can walk in authority when you understand that Jesus is the one that gives authority. But we see that there is authority in his name. And they're, like, they're blown away. And he's like, you want to see authority? I saw Satan fall. The, the highest of the dark power, the highest of the demonic authorities, I saw him so, fall like lightning. Don't freak out. I know you're excited, but it's actually a normal thing when you follow me. You see, when you walk in the authority of the name of Jesus, you will see things take place. Things that this world cannot explain. Supernatural, miraculous things because of the authority of his name. We're going to read from Acts chapter 16. We see that there is a, a girl that has been um, oppressed by a, 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 an evil spirit. And Paul commands, ready? Acts 16 verse 18, it says, She continued doing this for many days, but Paul was greatly annoyed. And he turned and said to the spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out at that very moment. We see this being outworked. In the name of Jesus, come out. And it came out. In the name of Jesus, there is deliverance. It's in the name of Jesus that people are set free. It's in the name of Jesus that people can be set free from what we might be intimidated by. But there is so much more power and authority in the name of Jesus than any demonic power. So we see in the name of Jesus, people are delivered. Let's go to Acts chapter 3. Acts 3 verse 6. Uh, Peter, Peter and John come past a man who is begging for money. And they say, I do not possess silver and gold, but what I do have I give to you in the name of Jesus Christ the Nazarene. Walk. And so now we see deliverance in Jesus' name. Now we see healing in Jesus' name. This guy's been sitting there for years, day after day after day. Nothing can help him. He asks for money and they say, we don't have money, but we got something better than money. In the name of Jesus, get up and walk. And he gets up and walks. There is authority for healing in the name of Jesus. It's in the name of Jesus. It's not in the name of Paul or by the power of Paul. It's not in the name of Peter or by the power of Peter. It's by the power and the authority of the name of Jesus. Now, this gets the attention of those religious leaders at that point in time. 
And we see in Acts chapter 4, they bring uh, Peter and John into the uh, into their religious meeting to be judged. And it says, Annas, in verse 6 of chapter 4, Annas, the high priest, was there, along with Caiaphas, John Alexander, and other relatives of the high priest. They brought in the two disciples and they demanded this. Look at what they ask. By what power or in whose name have you done this? So they registered that these uneducated, which they say a little bit later, normal, average kind of people were working miraculous powers and they knew that it wasn't by their own strength. And so they actually asked them, by whose power or in whose name have you done this? And that was a a typical kind of question at that point where you're looking at an empire where different people would do things on the authority of someone else. And they tell them that's in the name of Jesus. I was reading this a couple of weeks ago and I thought, I wonder does my life ever make people question, by what authority do you do those things? Or can they look at my life and just see, well, you do all that by your own strength. Everything you do, everything you've achieved, everything that goes on, that you could do that whether you're a Christian or not a Christian. Because something caught the attention of the religious and they said, by whose authority and whose name are you doing this? I wonder if our lives cause people to question, by what power are you walking in? Or do we just look like someone else without the name of Jesus? I wonder if we got pulled in front of a a, a judge and they said, what power did you walk in or what power were you working by if if that question would even be relevant or would they just see that? I say that for our Sunday morning services whenever we gather. If we can just have a service where we could do it without the Holy Spirit and just think, man, that was great. We just go to a yacht club or something. I don't want to gather and not have the power of God move to a point where we have to stand back and say, wow, God did something incredible that morning. God did something that we could not manufacture, that we couldn't make happen in our own strength. God did something supernatural, that broke chains, set people free, brought salvation to people's hearts, something that we could not do on our own. By whose power and whose name are you working in? So they ask this question. Do you know that when you, come to the, when you come to Jesus, when you are commissioned by him, then you are given authority by him. That is not a, 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 a debatable thing. You have been given authority. How you exercise that authority is up to you. How you walk in that authority is up to you. Whether you have it or not is not a question. Too many of us in the room right now are living like we don't have it. We're living like we don't walk in, we, we don't have the authority of the name of Jesus. If you have been called by him and you have been adopted by him and you are in his family, then you walk in his name. You have been given the authority. Don't question it. Begin to live it and live in it and walk in it because he has given you that authority. As I said, in an empirical kind of understanding, which is uh, back when, when, uh, when Jesus was walking on the earth, they would understand this with the Roman Empire, with different kingdoms. They would understand that there were times when people were sent as delegates or authorities on behalf of the emperor or on behalf of a king. This practice flowed through generations of history where we see even in, in the UK where the, the king or the queen would have what was called a king's messenger. Anyone ever heard of this before? And that messenger would be given the authority of the king to walk into different places and to bring about the king's will in that place. You see what I'm saying with this? If you've been called by him, then you have been given authority to walk into different places and enact his will in that place. You are his delegated authority in this place. His kingdom come, his will be done. That is where we walk. It's not, a, oh, maybe, maybe everyone on the, the left side of the room has this authority and everyone on the right side, we've got to kind of work really hard to get it. No, no, it's not because of us. It's because of the name that has saved us the name that has redeemed us, the name of Jesus. And if you carry that name, then you are in this place as well. 
So we see even in French history, they, they came up with this term where the king's messenger uh, would have access to go anywhere. They were actually given like a little red passport. And this little red passport gave them access to walk into different areas and to say certain things that needed to be enacted in that place. And the French phrase for that, and I'm going to say it in my French accent, is les yeux fleurs and les yeux pêcheur, which are... If you can't speak French, actually means let it be done and let that person pass. And so as they carried this, as a messenger of the king, they were brought into different places. And, and it was like, when you see this red thing, you got to let it be done. Whatever that person says, let it be I know some people are still laughing at my accent. Come back, to, come back Holy Spirit. Whatever... Whatever this says, whatever this person says, it needs to be done. Come on. You are on this earth today to bring the will of God in your family, in your community. Whatever he says, let it be done in the name of Jesus. And so I said before that all of us carry this authority regardless of whether we realize it or not. And our responsibility then is how do we steward the authority of the name of Jesus in a way that will bring liberation and not domination or oppression as the kingdoms and the authorities of this world would like to do. And so I'm going to give us three words that will hopefully help us with this idea of uh, authority. So these three words, identity, intimacy, and authority identity intimacy and authority now if we go back to luke chapter 17 verse 20 we see jesus said and we took note of it don't rejoice because the evil spirits obey you rejoice because your names are registered in heaven there is a principle in this and i see this outworked when it comes to people stepping into a leadership position stepping into a role of authority there is a good question to ask. Do they delight or rejoice in the authority that they have or the person? Jesus says, don't rejoice because they submit. Or, uh, ask that question. Are they now rejoicing because they get to tell people what to do or because they're serving in a place that God has called them to? He says, don't rejoice because of that. Rejoice because your names are in heaven. Rejoice because of what I have done. Rejoice because of who you are because of what I have done. And so this is something that we've got to think about uh, because when we walk in that authority, if you walk in it in a wrong way or an unhealthy way, you can actually do some damage. The church is in a, in a really sticky place right now. Not, not Grace Life, not just Grace Life, but the church in the West particularly because of the way that, that people who have been given authority have walked in authority in the church. And so we're not just building bridges to the community now, we're repairing broken bridges because of how things have taken place. And I dare say that these three things uh, flow into each other. Identity grounds authority and intimacy guards authority. Identity will ground authority and intimacy will guard authority. What do I mean by that? Well, if you think, uh, you know, I've done a lot of work with um, teenagers, even in Alter One, and uh, you know, family, kids that come from really dysfunctional families, and uh, they grow up and they, you know, they, they take on a lot of the behaviors and a lot of the things that uh, their, their parents have done, a lot of the brokenness. And uh, I've seen many times where a young lady will uh, look for love and she will find a guy and then she'll get pregnant and then uh, he'll leave and then she'll be left to raise a child by herself. She has a broken identity. She doesn't know who she is. She's been completely you know, thrown through life. And then you will see in the way that she parents that child that that broken identity will continue to perpetuate different things in that child's life. Why? Because she now has a place of authority, but she doesn't have grounding in identity. She doesn't know who she is. It's not her fault, but she's never been taught. She's never grown in that place of identity. And so the, the authority is misused or comes out in an, unhealthy play, in, in an unhealthy way. See it all the time with young people that haven't got a strong identity. You, you want to walk in authority, you've got to look after your identity. Know who you are. Know who God says you are. 
Because when you come from a place of knowing who God says you are, then the authority that you exercise comes from a healthy place. You're not trying to prove something about yourself. You're not trying to make people you know, get, get, get people's attention or uh, trying to fill in brokenness in your own heart by exercising authority over another person. It comes from a healthy place. Jesus is the example. He had perfect identity. He knew what the Father said about him. The Father loved him before he worked any miracles. We see that when he was baptized. And so he walks in perfect authority with a strong identity. Identity will ground your authority. People who know who they are in God can walk and exercise godly authority in a way that brings liberation and freedom to others because they're not trying to fill something in their own. It's actually a healthy thing. So know who you are. But identity is not just about knowing who you are. Identity is also knowing about why you are. Who you are deals with who we are, but why you are. Why are you on this earth? Your identity has to ask that question, why am I here? Christian, you're not here to just pass time. You're not here to just live your life, YOLO. You're here to make a difference for the kingdom of God. Your why in life will also help to ground your authority. Because you realize that, hang on a second, I'm on this earth for the will of God to be, to be outworked through my life. I'm not here for a holiday. I'm not on a cruise ship. I'm not just kicking back time. We are here for a purpose. God has given us a mandate to live out. He's given us a commission that we've got to, got to live out. And remembering why I'm here helps to ground that as well. Because I know then that the authority God has given to me is to enact His purposes, not my own. It's to see His will, not my own. And so I'm not going to exercise authority in a way that tries to get something for me because I know that I'm here for him. So authority, uh, identity will ground our authority. And I say intimacy will guard authority. The other thing that we see is that people go off track. When they walk away from Jesus and they're still in a position of influence or authority, it actually can be quite damaging. You can see the, the effects as someone kind of goes off track and loses that place of intimacy with Jesus, that they, they can become quite dangerous, that they can become uh, quite unhealthy as well. So intimacy with Him will always guard the way that we exercise the authority that He has given to us. That's why it's so important to stay close to Jesus, to walk closely with Jesus, that's why it means when he says, don't rejoice because of that. Rejoice because of this. Rejoice because you have relationship with me. Rejoice because your name is in, in heaven. Your name is in my book. I know you. Rejoice because of that. Here is one of the most sobering passages you'll see in, in the New Testament. Uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 21. And it says, not everyone who calls out to me, Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Only those who actually do the will of my Father in heaven, remember why you are here. On judgment day, many will say to me, Lord, Lord, listen to this, we prophesied in your name, and we cast out demons in your name, and we perform many miracles in your name, but I will reply, I never knew you. Get away from me, you who break God's laws. They prophesied, they cast out demons, they did these great works in his name, in the authority of his name. But he says, I didn't even know you. The disciples saw this. John says to Jesus, you see it in Luke chapter 9, I'm pretty sure, where he says, Jesus, there was other people casting out demons in your name and we told them to stop because they're not with us. And he's, yeah. But they were just using the name, the authority of the name, but they didn't know Jesus. That's why it's so important to focus on intimacy with him. Allow your identity to be shaped by him and then move in the authority that he has given you to walk in. You with me still? Good. Here's, a, here's another point. In the name of Jesus is not just a nice way to end a prayer. Now, you may have a little way that you finish your email when you write an email. Mine is kind regards. If I'm emailing another Christian, I might say blessings. 
if I'm emailing someone that I'm complaining about, I might say, please refer to last email now. <laughs> but you might have a little a, a tagline that you put on to the end of your email that, that you finish your email with. I suggest to us that in the name of Jesus has become like a nice little tagline that we chuck on the end of a prayer to kind of make it Christian. Not realizing what it means to pray in the name of Jesus. It's not just a nice way to finish your prayers. The, the, the absolute authority of that prayer is dependent upon the name of Jesus. You're praying in the name of Jesus almost as Jesus would pray. We see New Testament, the prayer kind of pattern is we pray to God the Father by the power of God the Holy Spirit through God the Son. We pray in the name of Jesus, meaning that our prayers are as he would pray. And so we're asking the Father, almost on behalf of the Son, in the name of Jesus, that this would take place. It's not just a, a Christian way to finish. We've got to understand that what we're saying is, I'm praying this as if I was putting the stamp of Jesus at the end of it. It's in his name. If I said to you, you know, or a king sent you out and said, I want you to go and, and take that land over there in my name, and you went out and you did it in his name, you're obeying what he has commanded you to do. When we pray, we are to pray in his name. Again, asking what he would be asking. Here's a good little filter, and I'm not saying that we shouldn't pray for anything that is uh, you know, our needs, all of those things we, 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 we do. But here's a filter. Would Jesus be praying this prayer? Is this something that I think Jesus would actually pray? Because I'm praying on his behalf. I'm praying in his name. I'm asking the Father in the name of the Son for this thing. Let's read a couple of passages here because this can get confusing. John chapter 14, 12 and 4 through to 14, it says, I tell you the truth, anyone who believes in me will do the same works I have done and even greater works because I am going to be with my Father. You can ask anything in my name, anything in my name, and, it, and I will do it so that the Son can bring glory to the Father. Yes, anything you ask, for, for, ask me for anything in my name and I will do it. John 15, verse 6. You didn't choose me, I chose you. I appointed you to go and produce lasting fruit so that the Father will give you whatever you ask using my name. So Jesus actually says to the disciples, pray and ask in my name and it will take place. You will see it take place. Now, you may be sitting there and thinking, I have prayed many different things in Jesus' name and I have not seen them take place. Can I suggest to us that one thing that can hinder this is the distorted nature of humanity, where we take something that we see like this passage and we create it to be about us rather than about him. So from one perspective, we hear this and we hear Jesus say, whatever you ask in my name, ask me and I will do it for you. And, and we come into our kind of our human perspective and we say, he's saying that he will do anything I want. So I'm going to ask for all of these things and get him to bless it. Now we have to go to the other side because what he's actually saying to them is that as you're walking out my will and purpose on this earth, whatever you ask of me for those purposes, in my name, I will do. Whatever you ask or need to fulfill my will and purpose in this world, I will do if you ask it in my name. Not, I want a Ferrari in the name of Jesus, but what... He wants to take place, his will to be done, I will do it in the name of Jesus. Here is, a, here is an awesome way to get all of your prayers answered. Pray what Jesus wants. Pray his will. Pray for his kingdom to come. And you watch, some of your prayers are going to get answered. It's almost like he's given us a blank check. 
And at the bottom it says, in my name, that's the seal of authorization, that what I pray is going to take place. Not because of who I am, but because of the authority of the name of the one that I represent. And we take that and we kind of put it to mean, oh, he's going to do what I want. Do you know that for many, 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 many years, uh, humans used to think that the earth was the center of the universe and that the whole universe revolved around the earth. It's called a geocentric understanding. And I think, well, that's not like us to think we're at the center of the universe. It's not like people to think that the whole world revolves around them or the whole solar system revolves around them, is it? No, we'd never think that. Well, <laughs> but then they discovered that the, the world, uh, that everything rotates around the sun, which is called heliocentric. So geocentric, revolving around the rock, heliocentric, revolving around the sun. I play with those two words because this is how our prayers can look. Meocentric, where everything revolves around me, or heocentric, where everything revolves around him. My prayer life then, if I'm looking to that and I'm looking, I, I want everything that I'm doing, everything I'm praying to be about him. My prayers revolve around him. My meditations revolve around him. My, my actions revolve around him. It's no longer just me at the center of this. It's that he is at the center. And therefore, my prayers are to see what he wants to take place uh, enacted. We see a corruption of this in what is often labeled the prosperity gospel and is one of my pet peeves, which is a distortion of the gospel. Yes, God wants to bless. Yes, God, it's in his nature to bless. But when we make ourselves the center of the gospel or the center of the doctrine, then we distort the good thing that God has in place. So when we pray, we pray from that place that we are actually in the center of his will and we're praying for his kingdom to come, not our own. And then when you pray in the name of Jesus, you have confidence that you're praying in the authority of Jesus. You don't have to question it. You don't have to doubt it. Let me finish with this. With great power comes great responsibility. Now, I thought that was a president that said that. Apparently, it's Spider-Man. Is that Spider-Man that actually said that? Who? Spider-Man's uncle. There you go, eh? There you go. Oh, I thought surely that's like some famous president or Jesus or something, but apparently it's Spider-Man. With great power comes great responsibility. Here is something that we've got to think about, and this is where we take personal responsibility here. If I have been given authority in Jesus' name, then I am responsible for how I outwork that. This is not something that I take off or I put on when I want to. I don't take off the name of Jesus on Monday and then put back on the name of Jesus on Sunday. You know, some of you got bumper stickers on your car with little fishes on it or... Jesus, bless something. Don't cut me off. And I, I've got to try not to beat the horn. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, we, are, we don't step out of this. If you're called to represent him, to walk in the name of Jesus, to carry authority in the name of Jesus, that's a full-time gig. That's not, I'm going to do this when I feel like it. I'm going to walk in this when I'm on a trip. I'm going to do this on a Sunday. That's like, this is what you're called to. This is who you are. You carry the authority of Jesus. Now, people are watching. People are looking. And I said it before, we've made some mistakes. The church has made many mistakes. And I'm hoping that God is bringing us to a place of repentance where we can walk in restoration for some of those things that have taken place. But I, for one, don't want to compound the, the, the problem. And I don't want our church to compound the problem. So know that with the power and the authority you walk in, there is also responsibility to represent Jesus well, to do as he would do. Yes, we are all on a journey. Yes, we are all being worked on by the grace of God. 
But as we carry his name, we carry the most important thing for this world. We want to do that well. Again, Paul writes to the churches. He writes to uh, the Thessalonians in verse chapter 2, verse 11. It says, For you know that we treated each of you as a father treats his own children, encouraging you, comforting you, and urging you to walk in a manner worthy of God, who calls you into his own kingdom and glory. We have been called by Jesus to represent him in this world. And so let's walk in a manner that is worthy of the call that is upon us. Because when people see your life, we want them to see Jesus, to see the real Jesus, to see the Jesus that is trying to reach them, not to repel them. And so we want to walk in a way that does that. I said before, yeah, we've got to repair some stuff, but I'll tell you this, God is moving. God is moving and he's catching people's attention. He's getting people's attention. And we want them to see something that is real, something of substance, something of truth. We want them to see Jesus. I'm going to pray for us this morning. Oh, thank you. Glory. Why don't we close our eyes and just bow our heads out of respect one for another. And I want to pray this morning that you know, God would bring that revelation, not just words that have been preached, but God's Spirit would bring revelation to our hearts of the authority that is in the name of Jesus. The authority that is in the name above every other name. So Father, we thank you in the name of Jesus for your word. And we thank you for your name. We thank you that you have called us. You have adopted us. You have chosen us. You have commissioned us. You have sent us to represent you in this world. And Lord, we just pray for that revelation to grow in our hearts of the authority that you have given us. Lord, let us not walk uh, in a way that would neglect that which you have put on us, that which you have spoken to us, that which we carry. God, we desire to walk in such a way that would bring liberty and freedom to the captive. In the name of Jesus, Lord, we pray that we would have our hearts stirred to pray for your will to be done in the name of Jesus and that we would walk in everything that you have for us. Father, I pray for us in this room this morning that have uh, we, we can kind of see that there is brokenness in our identity. We're unsure of who we are or why we are. I pray that you would bring revelation to that area today, that you would show us whose we are, who we are and what we're called to in this world. Lord, we thank you for uh, the intimacy that you give us. And we just pray that you would continue to keep us close. That as we draw near to you, you would draw near to us. And Lord, that we would walk in a way that is, is worthy of the call. I pray for every person in this room today that desires to walk in a way that is worthy of the call of God. That your grace would sustain and enable them to do exactly that. And Father, I pray for those in this room today that have almost lost hope that by calling on the name of Jesus, they would see the things take place that He's shown them. I pray that today, that something would spark again, a fresh, a fresh hope, a fresh faith that would come that they would stand in the authority of the name of Jesus. I pray that as people in this room pray for the sick in Jesus' name, that they will see healing take place. We pray, God, that as people in this room pray for your will 
in Jesus' name, that they would see it take place. We thank you for the authority of the name above every other name. And it is that, that name that we bow our knees and surrender and worship to honour you and you alone. We pray that you would be glorified in your church. In Jesus' name. Amen. We hope you've enjoyed listening to this podcast from Grace Life Church. For more information about us or any of our services, please visit our website at gracelife.com.au.